Good evening, everybody. Welcome in. What's going on, Husky? Good to see you. As always. Rudy, welcome in. Good to have you. Oh, don't thank me yet, yeah, Johnny. We got to see if you enjoy first. We'll get started here in just a couple of minutes. Just going to give everybody the chance to hop on in here before we get going. Any questions or comments before we get this one started? It was pretty good, Rudy. Pretty good. Couple solid rippers on meta. That one worked out nice. Definitely a big gap, though. Shop kind of sitting tight here. Not much to really do except wait for this one to do something exciting. But it's definitely shaping up nicely. So ideally, you get the chance to add a bit more back into the 60 area if it comes. But if not, I'll sit tight with what I have. Well, yeah, overall, nice day. New all-time highs in the market. Can't complain about that. Still remains pretty much no reason to be bearish ever. <laughs> Long-term what, Rudy? Gonna give it just a couple more minutes here before we get going. All right, I'm gonna send out one more message letting everybody know we're getting started and then uh, let's get this one going. I'm gonna give a lecture that I haven't given in a little while, so hopefully it'll be uh, new to most of you. All right, let's get this one going. I'm sure more will stop in as they become available. Welcome into the lecture for the evening, everybody. Tonight, <laughs> nice name. It's going well. Um, welcome to the lecture for the evening, everybody. Happy to have you guys all in here. Uh, like I mentioned in my message, I understand this lecture was uh, titled a little bit more as like it just kind of a general advanced lecture. Uh, I want to start off with this uh, kind of PowerPoint tonight on um, trading plans uh, and then uh, build on this kind of the basics that are presented in these slides. Um, so we'll see what everybody's thoughts are as we go through. As always, uh, got a couple remarks before we get too deep into this lecture. Oops, I didn't have a slide for uh, different remarks. But uh, as always, for those of you who haven't been to one of my classes before, for those of you that have been to one of my classes before, you've heard this speech plenty of times, but for those that are new in a lot of my classes, I do my best to structure it in a way where the difficulty of the content that we're covering progresses as we move throughout the lecture content. So uh, hopefully you should think that the beginning parts of this lecture are a bit easier or a bit less difficult. And as we continue on throughout the class, you should notice that the difficulty begins to increase, the complexity begins to increase, and vice versa. So uh, as always, if you guys have any questions, comments, concerns, please go ahead, put them in the chat. I'll be watching the chat throughout the duration of this class. So if you guys have anything that comes up that doesn't make sense or you want me to explain again, 
go ahead. Let me know as soon as it comes up. I guarantee there's no such thing as a bad question. Somebody else is probably confused about the same thing as you. So uh, I love to see your guys' participation. So any question that you think uh, I could help you with, please go ahead and throw it in the chat. We'll start it off with uh, Teresa's question before we get into it. Uh, off topic, but your kid wants to start buying stocks. What's everyone's favorite bro favorite brokerage to use for newbies? Honestly, this opinion might be controversial, but it's been my opinion for honestly over a year now. Uh, Robinhood, I think they've made some significant improvements and I think they're better than most other brokerages at this point. I think really, uh, at least in terms of what I'm familiar with, TD Ameritrade is the only one that has an edge over Robinhood. Um, but Robinhood is really, really solid. It's the best it's ever been, I think, and they're, they're only continuing to get better. Uh, there's a lot of brokerages that I don't like or don't understand or not familiar with, but I think Robinhood's great personally. So I think that's a great place to start. Um, anyway. All right. Uh, so I uh, always like to start these lectures off with questions and engaging uh, ideas uh, for the audience when possible. And the first question that I have is why use a trading plan? Uh, and some of you might not have any idea what a trading plan might be, what it might mean. Uh, but I want to ask the question to all of you in attendance. If you have any idea or any guess what a trading plan might look like, let me know why you think it might be significant. Why do you think a trading plan might matter? And I'll give you guys about a minute to drop some answers in the chat for me. So go ahead, throw some of your thoughts in the chat on this one. It's a nice start from Rudy. That was quick. Nice from Shay. I like that Cam Lesh, all in caps too, to let us know you're really not playing. I like that. Anybody else have any? Uh, there we go. Teresa, plan to stick with consistency is key. Yeah, excellent, excellent answers. We'll leave it at that. If any answers want to trickle in, we'll keep taking a look at those. But yeah, I think every single one of those answers. Yeah, Johnny, nice one. Yep, very, very good answer there. Yeah, so I think um, a lot of those answers are really, really high quality. Uh, and uh, I guess I won't go to this pyramid yet, but I, I agree with most of you, right? I, I think the big idea behind using a trading plan and the analogy I like to give is generally speaking, when things go well in our lives, at least, you know, more significant things, they're planned before we just show up and make it happen. Things that are uh, like, for example, generally speaking, when we're buying a new vehicle, we, we plan to do that, right? We plan to save the money. We plan to maybe visit a couple different dealerships. Maybe we plan to negotiate on the price. Maybe we plan to look in the used market first before we go to the dealership, et cetera, et cetera, right? Because buying a car is a big deal. It's important. Just like risking your hard-earned money in the financial marketplace is important, and it's a big deal as well. And as a result, there should be a planning process that you undertake in order to feel not only more comfortable with the decisions that you make, but ultimately, it's going to 100% contribute to more success in your future as a trader. And I think you can ask pretty much anybody who is a successful trader, um, including those in our Discord, including those of our staff members, et cetera. Every single one of you will tell you that this is one of the most major parts of becoming a consistently successful and profitable trader. Uh, I, I think every single one of you in this class right now could attest to this statement that when you're thinking you're just kind of gambling, when you're just making decisions willy nilly, when you're throwing random amounts of money into different trades, that is likely when you lost the most amount of money in your trading. And the second that you start actually thinking through your trades before you click the buy button is when you truly start to see some serious consistency build up and actual success and profits begin to build. And just to round this point out, again, this is the one of the most critical pieces of a trader's success. And I want to talk a little bit about this kind of graphic here uh, that I took from somewhere on Google. So I really love presenting this graphic. It's probably like the fifth time I presented this just because I think it's so good uh, and so simple at the same time. Uh, so this is, uh, I guess, what you could consider the successful trading hierarchy, at least according to this graphic. Uh, and starting from the top of the pyramid here, or at least the kind of all say the least important part of, of trading is entries, exits, and market selection. And what this means to me is actually making your entry, making your exit, and determining what stock you're going to trade, right? There's plenty of trade ideas available in any single day across so many different markets. And in my opinion, it's not really that hard to do either. I think you could teach most people how to do technical analysis in a couple months, um, if you're dedicated, right? It's not something that is incredibly complex. 
But as we work our way down the pyramid, you'll notice how things start to be a little bit more abstract and a little bit more difficult and something that's a little bit less easily taught. On our mid layer of the pyramid here, we have risk management, which I think the most important pieces of this specific um, piece of the pyramid here are position sizing and trade management. Uh, we'll talk about both of these items as we kind of continue throughout the PowerPoint, but at a high level, um, managing risk is the most important piece of any significant effort in life, right? Uh, those of you who work uh, at maybe a company that's focused on projects uh, probably have a pretty well-defined process for managing and defining risks, right? So understanding the risk of any given activity that you're involved in will always help you understand how to plan for that activity better. Like, for example, if you understand the risks of, I don't know, climbing Mount Everest, you'll actually be able to think through the things that you need to bring to Mount Everest in order to stay alive. Like, for example, what's the risk of climbing Mount Everest? Well, you could die. And what are the ways that you could die? Well, you could run out of oxygen and you could probably become dehydrated and you could fall down the mountain. So what are some things that you'll probably do to manage those risks? Well, you might bring clips to clip yourself into ropes. You might bring an oxygen tank to make sure that you can breathe at the top, right? Again, maybe a silly example, but that's that's really the point, right? Understanding the risk uh, of any trade that you're making helps you think through the outcomes and ways to mitigate those risks and deal with them before they're even real. One of my favorite quotes, and you'll hear me say that a lot, I have a lot of favorite quotes, um, but one of my favorite quotes is it's much better and this isn't the exact quote, but it's much better to be out of a position wishing you got in rather than being in a position wishing you got out, right? The first happens when you plan a trade and for whatever reason, you don't execute or you don't get the right opportunity, so you don't take it, right? So you're not in the trade, but you're wishing you were. The second part of that quote is being in a trade and wishing you were out, right? How many of you have felt that feeling or how many of you have felt like, you wish you sold earlier or you wish you did something, but you're still just sitting in the trade hoping or wishing you could get out. I know I could raise my hand for this. This is absolutely something that I've felt before. Yeah, a lot of you have probably felt this many times. If you've never felt this, you've probably never taken a trade or you haven't been trading for more than a couple months. I guarantee this is something that everybody will face at least once. We got a couple of you. Yeah, four of you definitely have felt this before. Yeah, being in a trade and wishing you were out is one of the worst feelings. And hopefully by the end of this presentation, we will have at least developed some background in your mind. That way you never have to feel like that again, or at least you know the reasons why you feel like that in ways around that. Finally, moving into the bottom level of the pyramid is arguably the most significant and most difficult part of trading at all, which is waiting for trades, so being patient, and ultimately just managing your emotions, right? As humans, we are inherently very emotional creatures, right? Some people might enter a trade and feel their heart rate speed up. Some people might enter a trade, see some red, and start hoping that it goes the other direction. Some people might enter a trade, see a lot of profit, and hope it continues in that direction, and they keep making more money. As humans, emotions get in our way of a lot of different daily activities, especially when money becomes involved. I think a lot of us can probably think of some time we made a bad decision when money was involved, whether it was related to family or a large purchase. I guarantee everybody has a story um, when they made the wrong decision because money added pressure to the situation and something went wrong, right? And in financial markets and in trading in general, every decision we make involves money. So automatically, there's always going to be more pressure. And it doesn't just involve any money, right? It, it involves money that you had to spend time working for, right? Whether you had your own business, whether you worked a nine to five, whether you worked a 1099 job or construction or whatever, you work for the money that you're trading with. And as a result, when you see that money gain or appreciate, uh, you're going to be pretty happy, right? You're going to feel like you're on top of the moon. You're going to feel like you have things figured out. And you never need to work again. And on the counterpoint, Right When you see that money start to disappear in a trade where you're red on, you begin to feel emotional because of that. Right, You're hoping that it goes the other direction because you see your money disappearing in front of you and you don't know what to do. So everything that we discussed about is all part uh, of, of kind of a natural, you know, standard traders development process. Right, This isn't something that's unique to any one of us in this lecture. This isn't something that's new that just started happening just a couple of years ago. This is how humans are. And this is simply just a fact of our existence. And while some of this might sound very negative, 
as we move throughout this lecture, we're going to develop different workflows, introduce different concepts, and also talk about specific examples in terms or in order to mitigate all these issues and put us all on a path to begin actually addressing these issues and starting to really turn our trading around. And excuse me, I, I'm listening to myself talk these last minutes, and I feel like I'm sounding like a motivational speaker or some kind of cult leader, but I, I, I can't assure you enough that that is absolutely not the case. Um, and well, hopefully you're, you're getting a little bit motivated, but in terms of this being some kind of like fraud, you know, um, I don't even want to try and explain myself. Anyway, um, just know that this is uh, not me just blowing smoke up your butt. Uh, this is seriously going to make a significant change in your trading if you can just start to employ some of the tactics that we begin to talk about. And yeah, I guess, you know, I'm not a cult leader because I'm not trying to sell you something and I'm not trying to uh, get you to drink the, the Kool-Aid, I guess. Um, so anyway, uh, hope, hope you guys don't, uh, don't think it sounds too crazy. All right, uh, let's keep this going. So as I talk about being a cult leader, I give this really cliche statement. Um, I, I really need to change this. Every time I see this, I want to change it. But truly, uh, planning your trades allows you to minimize your emotions and maximize your success. Uh, and I have a good amount of, of resources in terms of my existing trade plans. If you're looking to see what I do when I'm planning a trade, you look through my tab and this is what I'm doing right? It's 9.30 at night for me. I'm reviewing charts on the evening and I'm determining what looks the best for the next day. Here you can see I have multiple reasons why I like the chart. I have multiple different profit targets shown on the chart. I have contracts already picked out ready for me to execute on. Then sometimes I have another idea. I have a reason that I like it. I have contracts that I'm already ready to take. I have levels that I'm ready to enter and exit. So I show up to the market and I pretty much just say, okay, I'm just waiting for the market to give me what I planned for, right? I don't go wake up in the morning and wait for something to show up and look for everything and try and catch every move. That's not how I operate, right? That's how some traders operate. Me personally, I'm a bit more of a slower pace trader, right? I, I generally prefer swing trading. I prefer slower pace. I'm not much of a day trader. I'm not much of a scalper. While I do it here and there, I, I keep things slow. I keep things simple. I'm not interested in anything too crazy. And, and it, it, that just works for my personality better. And that's a big part of learning how to trade is understanding how you think and how you operate. Um, I personally like to be able to have a bit more time to think, a bit more time to make decisions. And when I'm swing trading, I have plenty of time to think about charts, make decisions on what I want to do. I'm not in a rush. There's no pressure. I can relax and I can really think through the decisions that I want to make. All right. So before I talk about specific trade plans, I want to talk about what I like to consider some trading rules. And before I go too far in depth on this, every single one of you should have some kind of guidelines or rules that you follow that allow you to get into a trade. And I'll give you a couple examples of these. And actually, I'm going to even pull up another really nice example that I like. Um, P Magnet, yes, uh, the price of the contract that I posted in my tab was mainly just for reference. It's not really like a, it doesn't mean I want to buy it at that price. It's mainly just to kind of show the cost to those who are reading it. Like you can see the, the relative cost, like generally where it's at, but yes, that is correct. Um, so let me find something, a graphic that I actually saw recently that I really, really liked, uh, as an example, it's from a trader that I, I, uh, I've been, uh, learning more and more about that I've been, uh, enjoying to listen into. So let me uh, save this really quick and open this up. All right. Uh, so this is something that I saw uh, a couple days ago online. And I really think this is a nice, yeah, yeah, you know, Oliver Kell. Yeah, I really like Oliver Kell. I read his book. I've been, I, I like paying attention to his Twitter page. I think he's really knowledgeable uh, and I like what he has to say. There's not many people that I, I like on, online trading. I think a lot of them are not quite up to board, but I think this guy really is uh, the real deal. So um, this, I'm not going to read through every single one of these rules. If you think this might be useful to you, go ahead, take a screenshot as a reference. Um, but this is an example of 10 different rules that this specific trader um, follows, right? Number one is, as it should be, putting risk first, right? And he's defining his maximum risk here. And he's a share trader. So three to 5% stop losses on equity. 
And number two is if you fail the plan, you are planning to fail, right? So basically the two things that we've talked about um, here, right? Number three is all about trusting your stops. So risk management is at the top of these rules. Number four is what we talked about earlier, right? A quote I saw, very, very important. And again, it's risk management. Um, and again, not going to read through the rest of them, but just this is the idea of that something that every single one of you should have some kind of document or sticky note or memorized list of rules that you need to follow that will allow you to get in or get out of trades. Um, I like this as an example. Honestly, if you want to just screenshot that this and say this, these are my rules now, there's not a damn thing wrong with that. Just study them and understand what they mean. Um, but Really, really nice uh, example here uh, of a set of rules. And what I want to talk about is one specific trading rule in specific. One last thing I want to mention before I cover this is I have a couple of specific rules that I follow for myself in order to manage risk. And you'll notice throughout this presentation, again, we're going to focus on managing risk because that is where the money is truly made. If you can stop your losers from being so much larger than they need to be, that alone will turn your PL around. So I have kind of really one main rule for myself, uh, which is if I take more than three losses in any day, um, that essentially means I need to instantly stop trading. And the reasoning behind that is if I take three losses in a day, there's two, one of two things that could be going wrong. Number one is that I'm taking too many trades and I've just accumulated a lot of wins, a lot of losses, and I'm just trading too much, right? Over trading. Number two is I'm just performing poorly, right? I'm just, I maybe I've taken zero wins and three losses. And at that point, clearly something's wrong. That's outside of the market, right? There's never a reason for me to be losing three times in a row. So for me, what that means is take a step back, close the charts out, go for a walk, go do something else, go to work, come back and evaluate what went wrong at a later date. Because taking three losses in a row is something's going wrong, right? There's something external that's happening. So that's effectively my main rule is protecting how many losses I take. I want to talk again about some more specific rules related to position sizing. But before I do that, I want to take a quick pause. I've been kind of talking for 20 minutes straight. Uh, how is everybody feeling so far? Is all this making sense? Anything new to anybody? Any questions, comments, concerns? Husky's feeling great. Husky's a champion. Shout out to Husky. Husky and Rudy. I've seen Husky and Rudy in probably the last 10 of my lectures, I'd say. Uh, those two are in it to win it. So respect to, to those two. I'm sure there's uh, some more people who have been in here in a lot of those lectures. But these guys are in it every single week. And I'm happy to see it. And I'm sure I, I guess I got to catch up with you about uh, how things have been going for you. All right. Everybody's feeling good. Any questions before we keep going? Happy to answer any questions. Again, there's no such thing as a stupid question. If you want me to recover something, I'm happy to go back and touch on it one more time. Speak now or forever hold your peace. Your question will never be answered. All right, let's keep it going. So talking through position sizing, um, again, I can't stress this enough. We're gonna continue to focus on managing risk. That needs to be your number one priority. You should always be considering the risk in any position before the profit. So let's consider this. My average position size is 10% of my portfolio with no stop loss. So for example, if I have a $5,000 portfolio, every position I put in approximately $500. In this case, if I lose 10 times, my portfolio goes to zero. And I understand this example is a bit simplified because 10% of your portfolio as you keep taking losses will decrease. But anyway, just take it for at face value there for me. Next, if my position size is 10% of my portfolio with a 20% stop loss, I will never lose more than $100 in any trade, right? So we just changed from having the potential to lose $500 from every trade, now only having the potential to lose $100 every trade, but we still have the same leverage in the position, right? So let's say for any trade, we have the potential to make 100%. So I could potentially make 100% from my $500, giving me $1,000 total, right? But I could also lose it all. In this case, now that I have some fixed stop loss, I still have the ability to make 100%, right? I need to still have a good entry. I need to have a high quality trade that I'm looking into. But now my maximum risk is much smaller. So that 
that change alone is now shifting the risk to reward just a little bit in our favor. And this is a really important note. I'm adding a fixed stop loss here, 20%, only because it's easy to understand. When you're first starting out, I recommend this is the way you apply a stop loss because it doesn't take really much um, to, to think through, right? A fixed 20% stop is easy to apply across the board. However, this is not how I would recommend to apply a stop loss when you are actually getting into the nitty gritty of things. So for example, uh, let's think of a trade, maybe like shop, because that's when I got in uh, a couple days ago. Uh, so I entered around this 59 buck area, $59. Uh, and my stop loss personally was not, uh, you know, 20, 10%. I was in shares. I got in right around here on this day, uh, which I entered before the day closed. We ended up rejecting. My stop loss was a weekly close below the prior lows, right? Which would have been right around 57-ish, right? And in this specific name, price moved a little bit lower. And it came down to test this 57. But I knew I'm in shares. I have plenty of time. And per my trade plan, I have absolutely zero reason to be concerned because I'm waiting for a candle close. So while I might be underwater below my stop on this day, I'm waiting for price to close below on the weekly. And it never did, right? So your stop loss should depend on your trade. But as a note, since my trade idea is really starting from the weekly time frame. I should be stopping out if something changes on the weekly time frame. And having that stop loss is something that should be part of every single trade plan you take. And in general, when paying attention to a chart, the main reason you should stop out is when the original reason or main reason that you're in the trade is no longer true. So for example, I'm looking for a hold, you know, simply a hold of this uptrend on the weekly. So if we were to close below the prior week's low, which we barely closed below this trend, if we close below this prior week's low, I'd get out, right? We're not holding this trend anymore. So I'm out of there. But it never happened, right? And since I'm entering based on the weekly time frame, I'm not going to stop out because the daily bar rejected this level. And I'm not going to stop out because we move back into the lows, right? It's There's no point. So regardless, right? Trading the time frame and setting a stop loss based on the time frame that you are trading is incredibly important. I just wanted to introduce that concept. This isn't a lecture on stop losses, so I'm not going to go too, too crazy on that, but just wanted to mention that. So obviously, right, example one is not the way we want to trade, right? We need to have some kind of defined risk. And any professional fund, any professional trader defines risk, right? Whether their risk is literally losing all, if that's the way they've defined their risk and they're comfortable with that, that's fine if you can be consistent doing that. But generally speaking, Every trade has a place where it is no longer valid. It doesn't matter what reason you're taking the trade for, whether it's technical, fundamental, or some insider information, there's always a point where a trade is no longer valid. And I can even give a really simple example in kind of an illegal case, just because it's probably easy to understand. Let's say, for example, I got an insider tip from somebody, which is illegal. This is just an example. Let's say I got an insider tip from somebody that told me that this company is going to, you know, have a drug that's going to make a lot of money, right? So I'm like, okay, perfect. I'm going to buy the stock, right? Simple. And then a couple days later, that same person says, actually, you should sell or let, he's not going to say actually we should sell, but he's going to say, ooh, actually, we're no longer going to make a lot of money on that drug. Something went wrong. Well, the original reason I was in the trade is no longer valid. So why am I going to keep holding, right? I was only in because this drug was going to do well. Now it's not going to do well. So I'm going to sell, Right. And obviously, that's probably pretty simple to understand. And again, can't trust enough, completely illegal, just for an analogy, um, not something that anybody in here should be doing. <laughs> just need to make that clear if the Fed show up. Um, but it's the same idea for the technicals, right? If you're looking at, you know, maybe a, a continuation of trend, you're paying attention to a 10 EMA above the 20 EMA, you see rising volume breaking through a key level. Well, if we fail back through that key level, you might want to stop out there. If the 10 EMA flips back below the 20 EMA into a bear trend, you might want to stop out there. So just looking at different pieces of your trade plan uh, and using those as a stop loss is also a better and completely valid way to define a stop. So in general, just to kind of summarize this discussion, close it out. If you're a beginner, new, still kind of working on your understanding of the charts, a 20, 30 percent fixed stop loss on every trade is fine. Uh, you're going to get caught on some trades because... You know, you just don't know what you don't know, but it's 
a fine place to start and it's good discipline to have. Once you're able to get a bit more background, a bit more knowledge and understand uh, actually what's going on in the chart and be able to make some kind of trade plans based on the technicals, you should start to look at technical clues for reasons to stop out. So just even another couple examples here. Uh, let's think of a few. Let me go back to the charts here. So let's think of a few. Uh, so let's say, for example, on Shopify, I was trading this breakout above 60, right? This breakout right here. There's two ways that I would trade uh, this breakout, or excuse me, there's two ways I'd define a stop loss, right? So let's, let me just clear this all up, make it all clean and mark out this $60 level, $60. Make it very clear what's going on here. So we're breaking above this key level. There's two ways I define a stop. Number one way to define the stop is the low of day on the day that we broke out. So 59.2 would be my stop. If we break below here, I'm out, right? That's one stop loss. Another stop loss could be a close back below 60. So if we broke out below 60 during the day and then failed back under 60 and the daily closed back under 60, I'd close it out, right? So two ways to define the stop. And you'll notice, right? There's different ways to define every trade. And you could even go further. And if you bought shares on this break of 60, you might say, well, my stop loss is the real swing lows down here. Like I'm stopping out if we break the real lows at 56.30. Great, that's fine. It just depends on what type of trade you're taking. I'd use this stop if I'm buying shares. I'd use this stop if I'm buying July contracts. I'd use this tightest stop at 60 if I'm buying weeklies or next week's or June contracts. Simple, right? As I have less time to be right, I'm gonna make my stop a bit more aggressive. That's the big idea and that's the example there. And yeah, Flacco, good, yeah, you're in it. And me personally, I'm now green on the trade. Uh, my entry is somewhere in the 59s. So I'm just going to set a stop at break even, and I'm not going to care anymore. So now I've got, you know, a couple, I don't know, three, four, five percent profit. I don't know exactly what it is. Yeah, something like three percent profit. Uh, so I'm just going to set a stop loss at break even here at the end of the week and pretty much walk away. Because at this point, that is the best position to be in it as a trader, right? And this goes into kind of calming your emotions. If you can get to the point where you've made 10, 20%, maybe you've trimmed a bit of your position. Generally, what I would do, set a stop at break even, and you have absolutely zero reason to panic, zero reason to stress. You have nothing to worry about anymore because that is the best position for any trader to be in, right? You're no longer asking yourself if I'm going to make money. You're asking yourself, how much money am I going to make, right? You don't need to be concerned about stopping out in the red anymore because you planned your trade, you had your stop loss ready to go, you shifted your stop loss up to break even, so you literally can't lose money. You just wait, wait and see if your profit targets hit. If they do, great, you're gonna sell some there. If they don't, cool, you made break even, whatever. You didn't lose money and it didn't work out and you move on to the next one. That is the best position any trader could ever be in. All right, let's get this going. So um, there's kind of two examples that I wanted to uh, talk about here in terms of setting profit targets. And, and I'm, I'd like to think uh, which one, I'd like to ask which one you guys think is the best way to do things. So um, the first scenario or first trader sets their profit target wherever they feel like, and they determine their profit target after they enter a trade. And for example, when they enter a trade, they sell most of the position when they're up 5% just because they feel like it. There's no reason, there's no rhyme, it's just, yeah, 5%, I feel like selling. And if my feelings guide me wrong, or if the trader's feelings guide them wrong, they don't really know what exactly happened. They just can only blame themselves. They can't study any charts. They have no idea how to reflect on that or improve on the next time because it's just their feelings. That's trader one. Trader two defines their profit targets before they enter a trade and scales out of positions when it makes sense, which would be when those profit targets are reached. This trader can justify when it is time to tell, time to sell and feel confident and comfortable and also remove all emotions from the decision, knowing that you sold at the right time. With this in mind, and per the discussions we've already had today, which trader sounds like they're doing the right thing? Trader one at the top or trader two? Question for the chat. What do we think?
seeing a lot of twos. Why do we think Trader 2 is doing it right? I mean, what is it? What is it that Trader 2 is doing? What is it? Johnny says structured. Rudy says plan, not feelings. Plan, plan, plan. Exactly. Plan set before entering the trade. Planning the trade. Lecture's over. You guys all got it. We're done here. Just kidding. No, absolutely. Yes. Guys, the benefit of having the plan is, number one, you literally have nothing to stress about. You go into the day, you wait for price to either come to your entry or break your entry. You click the buy button when that happens. You sit back. You wait for your stop loss to hit or your profit target. You do no thinking. All you do is react to what price does. Does that not sound relaxing? I mean, that, that sounds awesome, right? I mean, you literally do all the hard work when the market's not even open. You show up. You wait for the market to give you what you want. If it does, you press a button. Then you walk away and wait for the market to do something else. That's it. There's no babysitting. There's no panicking. There's none of that. You're already prepared. You just need to wait for price to either move into your stop or move into your profit target. And it doesn't matter if it does either. Because when you define your stop loss before you enter the trade, you've already accepted the fact that you can lose money. right? You've already thought through that. So if you do lose money, you're not, oh, I couldn't believe this happened. Or you don't have trouble accepting it because you've already thought through this. You already understand, yeah, if price comes here, you know, this, I'm wrong and I'm going to lose money, right? That's it. You already thought through everything that could go wrong. You've already managed all the risk, right? You know what can happen. You know what can go well. You know what can go wrong. You thought through it all, right? And it doesn't matter why you go wrong. Maybe, you know, World War Three starts and your stop loss hits. Well, that sucks, but at least I knew that I could have been wrong right? That would be pretty ridiculous. But anyway, great job, everybody. So yes, obviously, trader one is not doing the right thing. Now, I want to see an honest question, an honest response from everybody. How many of you are currently behaving similar to trader one? I know I have in the past. You used to. Yep. I think everybody can 100% say they used to if if they don't anymore. Yeah, we got a lot of you. So I'm going to tell you right now, every single one of you that just put me in the chat and every single one of you that didn't put me in the chat but thought me, you got to get to work, right? You're doing the right thing by being here, but you got to get to work. There's going to be some effort that's required, right? You're going to need to spend a little bit of time making some plans. It doesn't take much. It doesn't take much time at all. I spent 30 to 45 minutes last night reviewing charts and making plans. I mean, you could see what it took me to make these. 9.30, I posted meta. 9.39, I posted shop. I mean, obviously, I thought through those a little bit before I just went to post it. But it, it, it's not a significant effort, right? All you need to do, and again, you don't need to do much. Right. It's going to take practice. Obviously, it's I'm, I'm maybe a little bit quicker because I know what I'm looking for, but it's not like this is change the world effort. And I think one challenge that I'd like to propose to everybody who said me is spend. Let's make something easy. Let's make set an easy goal for all of ourselves. Spend 10 minutes a night. Look at one chart. Or two charts and just chart some levels, work through it. And then build up on that week by week. So start looking at five charts and actually see if you could find a trade for the next day in one of those. Then look at 10 charts every night and see if you could find one really good trade that you really like for the next day. A plus setup, right? You got to form those habits. You have to scan through charts. You have to be paying attention and you have to immerse yourself in the markets. You have to understand the holistic picture of what the S&P is doing, of what the Qs are doing. Just an AMB one hour. Perfect, right? Just, just look at one chart a night. Just draw a couple levels, 10 minutes, easy. Everybody can do that. I don't care what you have going on in your life. Everybody can spare 10 minutes. Take, you know, put your phone out for 10 minutes or, you know, go to sleep 10 minutes later. Just spend a little bit, little bit of time every night on the charts. I guarantee you, you're going to notice a difference in a month. 
100%. And those of you that stick to that challenge, follow up with me in a month. I guarantee you're going to notice a difference. ESNQ, perfect, Rudy. Build up on that. So you do ESNQ, start looking at Apple. Look at Amazon, right? Everybody's doing the right thing by being here tonight, but we all need practice. By no means am I perfect, right? I'm not here on some high horse saying, you guys are all idiots. I do this right. No, I, I mean, I get busy, right? I go, sometimes I go weeks and I look at a chart when things happen, right? I'm not perfect. You should be either, but building these habits. Yeah, sacrifice your IG time. And I just watched a, a, an excellent video on, on kind of how, I mean, I don't want to offend anybody here, but social media, you know, when, when social, when something's free, when something's free, you're the product. So the more time you spend on those things, the more company or the more money those companies make, those companies make money by keeping you on those apps. It's a fact. And Discord probably does the same thing. Discord makes money by keeping us on it. But I mean, here we all are, at least we're using it for the right thing. But yeah, just that's, that's a great way to find some time is carve out 10 minutes from, you know, some phone time. All right. So um, you've been trading on your own for three weeks and had two red days. That's awesome, Rudy. Congratulations. Nice job. Really happy to hear that. Really, really cool. That's the way to do it. Everybody's going to get there eventually. And I think that's important to note is that's the goal of OOT. Like our goal isn't to keep you here for your life and follow alerts. Like that's, that's not what we're trying to do here. We're trying to teach you how to trade give you some alerts while you're here, show you how it works and get you out of here. <laughs> I, I mean, we love when people stay, you know, when people make it and they stay and stay in the community and we'd love for you all to stay, but the goal is to teach you how to trade and kind of let you leave, <laughs> you know? So th that's the goal for everybody is for you to be able to teach your own lectures or teach your friends how to trade. Anyway. Um, one other rule that I wanted to introduce is having consistent position sizing. Uh, and this is just a rough graph of, of how to potentially uh, have consistent position sizing. And this is something that you'll hear flips mention a lot in VC is those individuals that don't have consistent position sizing face a problem that looks like the following. Say, for example, I'm putting, you know, $500 into every trade. I, I take a couple wins, like I take nine wins, you know, I make some money on those $500. Then all of a sudden I get confident. I think I got it figured out and I put three grand into a trade and I take a small loss, but a significant one. And all of a sudden I just wiped out all the profit from those prior trades, essentially wasting weeks of effort potentially. And that's all because I wasn't able to control my position sizing. So position sizing is one of the things that I think newer traders really fall into the trap of the fake confidence where they do well on a couple. Then they're like, oh, I got this figured out. I'm going to size up. And I mean, I did that on my first trade. I, I was trading hundred, two hundred dollar positions. Won a couple, lost a couple, and I was like, "All right, I'm going to add a thousand dollars in my port and go two k into one position." And then I blew my port the next week. So <laughs> I fall into the same trap. It's 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 just in human nature, right? We think we think we got it figured out, and that's not the case. Regardless, consistent position sizing is really important because having that consistent position sizing makes it easier to take a loss, right? You can take a loss and it's not so detrimental to the progress that you've made. At the end of the day, the losses are what really set us back. It's those big losses that screw all the progress we make over. Small losses are okay. Small wins are okay. Big wins are okay. Big losses are unacceptable. Absolutely unacceptable. If you take a big loss, every single time you need to take a step back, and reflect and figure out what you did wrong. Because if you're taking a big loss, right? And it's yeah. relative, right? A big loss could mean something different to everybody. But if you're taking a big loss, you did something wrong. You didn't cut soon enough. You put yourself in a position to lose a lot of money are the main two things you could have done. You went too heavy or you didn't listen to your stop loss. Those are the only two things, only two reasons to take a big loss. You didn't stop out or you had too much money in the trade. So every time you take a big loss, take a step back, figure out what you did wrong. You're the only one that can do that. Nobody can tell you what you did wrong in every trade. Unfortunately, um, I'm not there to sit over every single one of your shoulders and tell you when you guys screw up. And nobody's there to do that for me either, but sometimes it'd be helpful. Anyway, hopefully you made that point. So this is just an example of some common position sizes. Um, yeah, 
again, just be consistent, right? Put the same amount of money into every trade and don't just size up because you make money, right? You know, if you grow your portfolio from $10,000 to $20,000, withdraw 10,000 and do it again. What I usually do when I'm growing my portfolio is I trade with a fixed amount of money. So typically it's about 25,000. And every week I withdraw. Every week that I'm over that enough, I just withdraw. Boom, that's it. I'm not trying to grow the 25,000 into 300,000. I'm going to take my couple thousand a week, withdraw, do it again. It keeps me consistent, keeps my position size consistent. I don't get confident and I don't need to trade with that much size because I know how I get, right? I've been trading for long enough to know that if I add more size, I'm just going to make problems for myself. I'm going to make my life harder. So you have to understand yourself as well and understand your own emotions because that's a big factor in this. All right, let's keep this going. What was I supposed to say for the big idea? Oh, this is an old example slide. What even is this? I don't even remember. I must've made this a long time ago. Anyway, I'm not gonna cover this big idea slide because I think we've definitely gotten that point across. Um, yes, I do wanna talk about this checklist though. So this is a checklist that we, or I think I put together live in a lecture maybe a while ago, or maybe I put this for the lecture, but. This is a checklist, very high level, that everybody should be able to check the boxes before they take a trade. First one, do I have a trade plan, right? Am I prepared to take this trade? Me personally, there was multiple trades that I was eyeing today, notably VRT. VRT. I was looking at VRT today very closely, and I noticed that midday, I noticed it right about here. It had broke above the prior day highs and started to consolidate on declining volume. But I was at work. I didn't have really time to throw a trade plan together that I'd be confident with. So I had to sit out. Had to sit out. And I, was, I wanted to take it so bad. And I really liked it. And Tilio put me on. But I, I didn't have a trade plan. So I was like, you know what? I can't do it. And of course, the stock price rips 2% in two hours would have been probably 100%, 200% on options. But I didn't have a plan, so I didn't take it. And while I'm sad I miss it now, I know that mentality is going to save me in the future, and it already has. Number two, is my trade plan reasonable and complete? Complete meaning, do I have profit targets? Do I have a stop loss and an entry? Reasonable meaning, is it actually based on facts or is it based on opinion? For example, am I is my trade plan, oh, somebody said this is going to rip. Or, oh, I like this stock because I like Google. Well, okay. You know, that might be okay. But you want to have some concrete detail that you can point to. Because having a reasonable trade plan means also you'll have a reasonable stop loss. Like, again, this is very hypothetical, but into the extremes. But let's say the only reason I wanted to get into a trade is because I like the stock. Okay, great. I like Google. Well, when do I stop out? When I stop liking Google? When the hell is that going to happen, right? There's, you don't have any reason to get out of the trade. And again, right, it always points back to risk. You always need to be managing risk. Next up is, is my trade plan high quality? Am I forcing this trade or does it meet the criteria for a high quality setup? Simple, right? Have I studied this setup before? Have I traded something like this before? Or is it something that I'm forcing just because I want to take a trade? Number four. Am I in a stable mental state? Did I get enough sleep? Did I wake up early enough? Am I angry about something? Am I upset about something? Am I stressed about something else? When you're trying to deal with money and trade, it's not going to go well. I've seen so many people try and force trades on vacation when a relative passed away, when they lost a bunch of money. It never is a good idea. I've even tried to trade on vacation, and it's, it's just a terrible idea. Be on vacation. Don't trade. Am I prepared to follow my trading rules, right? Am I in the right mental state? Have I read my rules this morning? Am I ready to follow these rules religiously? If not, you shouldn't be entering a trade. And if you can't answer yes to every single one of these questions, you shouldn't be trading. And this is something that you should read before the market even opens or before you start to take a trade. Check this checklist out. Are you ready to execute? Very, very important. And this is a super easy process to incorporate into your trading day. It takes 
you know, two minutes to either check these boxes or cross them out. Another rule that you could even create for yourself is if you don't get good enough sleep, you don't trade. It's totally reasonable, right? If I know that I want to have a late night before, I'm going to cancel my alarm for the next day and I'm not going to trade, right? Because I know I'm not going to make the right decision if I'm not well rested. That's it. Can I link this PDF so you can print it out and put it on your desk? You're damn right I can do that. And I'll do you one better. I'll just put it in my tab right now. But I'm also going to minimize it so you can't see that I need to activate my windows. <laughs> I'm going to put it in my tab right now. There we go. Can't tell if that tag worked. It seems like it could have bugged out or something. Anyway. All right. So I wanted to go through some of the technicals today, but this took me a little bit longer than I expected it to. How do you guys feel about maybe next week being like a swing trading masterclass or something like looking through and kind of my process for scanning for trades and yeah, just like an hour long class on finding and planning swing trades. Cool with that. And then maybe we could even get flips in here to do like a, a guest feature for like some day trade planning. I know you guys love flips. You guys love VC. So I can give you the best of both worlds. Day trades are too stressful for me too. I know I can't, do, I can't, I, I, I don't know how flips does it. The day trades that open. Cool. Let me let uh, Archon know. Now I'll ask flips right now, if he's good for next Wednesday. Let me DM them. Yeah, same here. Swings are swings are much more mellow. Uh, what time next week? Same time, same place. I'm I'm confirming with Flips and make sure making sure he's available. But I know we haven't had Flips in here in a while, and maybe even Empanada too would be fun. Yeah, maybe we could get a couple people in here. We could have a bigger lecture, maybe. We could try to have the whole team, and I could prepare something for it. I think that would be a good time. When will the actual master classes begin? Honestly, I don't know. I I know about as much as you all on the master classes. I haven't been involved in the development of those, so I'm unsure. Yeah, iPhone, it's fine to play to your strengths. If you're better at swinging and you know you want to get better at scalping, feel free to practice scalping. That's honestly one of my goals too, is I'm not a very good scalper. I just can't think that quickly. Um, I don't know how River does it when he's like super high, but um, yeah, he's an amazing scalper. If you want to learn how to scalp, just just watch him. I I don't know how he's so good. I really don't. He just, a lot, it's just practice, right? Just like anything. He's an idiot, but he's done it for so long that you just get good. I mean, I'm an idiot too, but you do something long enough and uh, you figure it out eventually, right? Cool. Oh, hang on. We have a podcast lecture next week. Okay. All right. We're doing a podcast lecture next week. So we'll do the swing trading class in two weeks. Sorry. Week of the 19th. Oh, that sucks. I'm going to be in Texas for that, though. So I'm not going to have my full setup. Well, I'll see if I can figure it out. Hopefully, it's hopefully it still works. We're in Texas. I'm going to be in uh, uh, Dallas-Fort Worth area in uh, 
in Grand Prairie. It's going to be damn hot here in Houston. I wanted to come down to Houston last time I was out there, but it's too far from there. Yeah, Texas is hot, bro. Hella hot. Uh, yeah, so uh, I guess just to kind of close this discussion out before I answer some of these questions, uh, for the purposes of this class, I think we're done. Uh, I'll stick around and answer any questions, but just so you guys know the schedule for the next two weeks before you go, next Wednesday, 9 p.m. Eastern, we're doing a podcast. We're going to have as many of our staff there. Uh, it's going to be a big one. Everybody always loves our podcast lectures. We talk about a wide range of different topics in those. We'll cover whatever you guys want. I'll probably send out a poll before the end of the week. We'll talk through options, figure out what you guys want to hear about. And we'll get a big chunk of our team, Flips, Tilio, River, Empanada. We'll get everybody out there. It's going to be a good time. Week after that, we'll do a big detailed swing trading class with myself. Hopefully Flips as well uh, and maybe maybe some others. All right. Cool. So, yeah, with that, let's answer a couple of your questions here. Uh, you're trying to upgrade your trading setup. You have a laptop and monitor. Any recommendations? Me personally, I just actually upgraded my setup a couple of weeks ago. I just bought a gaming PC off Facebook Mar Marketplace. Uh, I don't really play video games, but I just got a gaming PC. It was like around a K and yeah, it's been a pretty nice upgrade for me so far. I mean, it runs charts really well. That's all I really care about. So yeah, gaming PC, I guess would be my, my best recommendation. Uh, I used to have the Mac um, and it's not really my, I, I don't really like, I think I kind of screwed up the Mac essentially. I like, I was running two monitors off of it and charts all the time. And I think it just kind of blew the Mac out. So uh, I just got a standard, standard PC. Yeah. I got the window. I'm on the windows now, but I also have, a, I also still have the Mac for when I'm traveling. So I, I, I'm using both now essentially. So I'll still be able to do the lectures when I'm in Texas, but um, yeah, it's a, it's a 13 inch screen. So it's a little bit smaller. So it'll be kind of annoying, but we'll figure it out. Uh, I have two monitors right now. I have two monitors. I think I sent a picture of my setup a while ago. I don't know where it is now, but yeah, it's somewhere around. Anyway, yeah, I got two monitors. One's like, uh, I don't know, 25 inches or something. And the other's like 20. And then the PC is pretty big. All right. Somebody said, can I check out this? Yeah, sure. Considering I always check out these random ass stocks at Norbert Ass, I'll, ask, I'll check out something normal. Oh, yeah, I forgot to look at this. Uh, Disney, I know Shark got into it. I personally am not ready to enter um, just yet. It kind of is acting like this gap wants to fill, uh, in my opinion, fully uh, back down to this 100 level. That said, though, don't take what I'm saying with too much weight because this would not be the first time where Shark hops in a trade. I don't see it the same way he does, and it just absolutely blows out of the water. Um, but me personally, my personal opinion, which should not influence what Shark's doing, you got to ask him about what he's seeing because he might see it differently. Uh, I'm either waiting for this trend to break or this gap to fully fill or at least come back into this $100 level. I think this $100 level is very reasonable to expect the test of that, especially while we're still remaining under this trend. Additionally, the moving averages are still technically in the downtrend. So me personally, I'd be sitting tight on Disney, but again, Shark guys on a different level so i wouldn't be surprised if it just absolutely goes nuclear tomorrow walmart i haven't looked at that in a while oh well i mean this is very clearly um breaking out new all-time highs they split yeah they did split i didn't even knew that wow i have not looked at this in a long time all my levels are gone i think yeah all my old levels two of my old levels um honestly my opinion here is this one looks like it's got it it's ready for higher however this is not the place to be entering uh, a new position oh you swung your runner that's perfect that's exactly how i do it there's no reason to really get long right now i mean it's very extended from the moving averages second extension from the moving averages makes the probability of reversal a bit higher um I wouldn't enter new longs here, but yeah, I don't got a damn thing wrong with swinging a runner. I mean, the trend is completely up. It's very strong. This thing's effectively going parabolic. So yeah, not a damn thing wrong with it. In terms of next target, we could take a look at that. Let's see. Huh. I mean, 
this was a kind of rough fib extension, but I mean, kind of looks like it could go to 69. Yeah, not sure when to take it. Yeah, that's kind of the hard part, ain't it? Uh, let's take a look at this. Um, buh, 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 buh. I mean, if you were able to make it to the second deviation B band around 68.50 or 69, you should definitely be selling. In terms of like a short term, we could do like a measured move as well to figure out a reasonable target. Let's check this out really quick. So when you take a look at the measured move, you look at the previous range that price was in before. And once price broke out, you just duplicate that. Wow. Which also brings it around to 68.50. So I mean, I don't know, tentatively, I'd say try and take it at either 68.50 or um, which 68.50 is super aggressive. I'd say 68.50 or let's see, if you want to be aggressive, if we lose 67, you could take it. If you want to give it a bit more room and you don't care, you could say if we lose 66.50 on the hourly, you could take it. That's really uh, all I got there, though. Nice flag on the one hour AMD. Let's see. Yes, it is. Yeah, you're correct. And the daily has just been sitting in this range too. It's definitely coiled up to do something here soon. I mean, it's done nothing for two weeks, really. Um, I'd almost be watching like this little trend here. Yeah, I mean, this one feels like you get long above 166. So I'd be watching if I was interested in trading it. But yeah, that's definitely a little flag there. Volume patterns look okay. This is a bit brutal here. But yeah, above 166, I think you could pretty comfortably get long there. I'll even set an alert and watch it. Looks good. Yeah, spy. Obviously, new all-time highs today on the SPY. Um, next logical targets above, honestly, it'd be probably best to look at the SPX. Um, we're honestly, I mean, realistically, it's probably 5,400 at this point. That's what I'd be looking towards. Blue through 5,300 today. Once again, let me fix this really quick. Yeah, I mean, realistically, it looks like 5,400. That's what I'd be watching. Yeah, on new all-time highs, 5,400, I think is what I'd be looking for. What that corresponds to on the SPY is probably like 4, 538 to 540, somewhere around there, what I'd be expecting. Yeah, I mean, similar to kind of Walmart, this isn't the place to be getting new longs necessarily after we've already bounced off the moving averages. Um, but yeah, it definitely doesn't look weak. But I think we also have some data tomorrow or maybe Friday. I don't remember what it is. If it's PCE, um, I, ha I can't remember. But yeah, anyway, some data coming out into the end of the week. All right, everybody. Well, I appreciate the time today. Um, this was, I, I really enjoyed this lecture. Honestly, it was much more fun than I anticipated. But yeah, really enjoyed it. Hope you guys all enjoyed just as much as I did. Uh, I'll see you guys all again to remind you podcast lecture next week make sure you're there week after that we'll do a swing trading dedicated class talking about detailed how to make the trade plans uh, that we introduced tonight so uh should be a really really good two weeks ahead hope you guys are here for it let's uh yeah hopefully we're set up for a really good june and uh yeah appreciate you guys' time this evening as always and uh can't wait for the next one as always any questions comments concerns you know where to find me feel free to send a message at any time and i'll make sure to get back to you Yes, podcast will be on Zoom in the Discord. You will see it live. We, it's usually just a lecture just like this. We just call it podcast. All right, everybody. Appreciate the time. We'll see you on the next one. Thanks so much. Adios.